All right. Because of the you laugh, you spin challenge that we did on the main YouTube channel, I now, even though I've watched two lore videos, but people are like, you watched the wrong ones. I'm now watching the MatPat four-part series. This is supposed to explain everything, apparently. Everyone said, this is the one. This will explain everything. So this is what I'm watching. And it's four fucking parts, so... Fuck it, dude. Let's get it. We end the torment. 19 books, 11 games, 8 whole years, all leading to this moment. The ultimate FNAF timeline is finally complete. The pieces are in place for us. Now, all we have to do is put this story of tragedy, jealousy, and loss back together. But that's just a theory. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! He's made over 50 videos. Oh my god. Uh, chat, if I ever, if uh, YouTube chat, if I ever get to a point where I've made over 50 FNAF videos, put me out of my misery, okay? This one is big, my friends, and I gotta admit, kind of nervous. I haven't attempted a timeline video on this franchise since 2018. Back in the days when Mike was the crying child, Afton coming back was actually a surprise, and Fazgu wasn't a phrase I'd ever thought I'd have to utter. Wow! I don't know any of that shit. Don't watch the fourth part. Pezzy watched this series last night and gave up. And you'll know why soon. Did he really? Okay. It is exhausting trying to keep track of this whole franchise, which honestly is why I'm here today. The lore at this point is complicated. Even fucking Matt had agrees. Thank God. Look, thank God. I've been saying that I've been a fucking savant of this full of speculation and theory so to hopefully make it a little easier for everyone and to give us all a baseline to talk about this franchise moving forward into the future it's time to it's reveal hard, my current hard, working snap timeline Five but just before Freddy's i do i just want to explain a couple of things first this timeline is massive seriously it is huge this thing towers over any video project we have ever done on the channel but when you look at the totality of this franchise the story of fnaf really boils down to the story of one man william afton his successes his failures, his rise to becoming co-owner of one of the most successful restaurant franchises in the world, and his eventual fall to the monsters he helped to create, only to then be reborn in a new digital form later. Sorry. Three main chunks. The foundation of Freddy's, how the business started and how it came into being. The we Afton know this. The era, yeah. William's decades-long murder spree, and right. post-Purple Guy. Basically modern it's snap. Everything that happens Holy after shit. the pizzeria simulator months. fire. And because there are lots of new big revelations in this thing that seemingly come out of nowhere, as well as just points I want to talk about further, I decided to dedicate one episode to each chunk. I originally wanted it to be one seamless, continuous video, but it just felt incomplete without some sort of explanation at the end of each one. Once this whole thing's done, I promise I'm gonna merge all the narrative bits into one massive video so you can just skip my explanations. But for now, this just felt like the best, most satisfying right, 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 right. strokes of the franchise. So in order to make sure that you guys know that I'm not just pulling answers out of thin air, not only am I discussing some of the more controversial bits at the end of each chunk, we're also putting in a handy little graphic in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, which will show thumbnails, video- Oh my god, I get it! Your audience is children! We don't have to fucking spell it out for everyone! Oh my god, I know, right? Rada, rada, rada. The story of a loving, obsessive father who slowly descended into madness and along the way discovered the secret to eternal life. He became gay. Our story begins not in the 1980s or even in the 1970s, but all the way back in the 1930s. It was what? Ha! Huh? The throes of the Great Depression, and people were in desperate need of cheap entertainment, especially in Utah, one of the states hit hardest. For Oh, this happened in Utah? That makes fucking sense. Five Nights at Freddy's is built in Utah. That makes sense. Fourth highest unemployment in the nation and full of transients. People looking for work in Salt Lake, finding none, and ultimately moving on to find their fortunes out in California. People were tired and they were hungry. But as they traveled, there was one thing that could lift their spirits. A simple roadside attraction called Fred Bear's Singing Show. The ad were plastered all over town featuring an animated it's bear drawn in the popular fuck. holy shit is this real is this actually real is, is the timeline that deep that it goes back to the 1930s is that actually real yes i mean if map has fucking saying it pie-eyed cartoon style for characters at the time he resembled cartoons like mickey mouse felix the cat betty boop it immediately said that this fred bears was a place where you could bring the family and the price honestly couldn't be beat for 50 cents you could get food and entertainment as you watch the local trained real life dancing bear perform on stage normally oh. you only got to see dancing bears at large traveling circuses like barnum and baby
daily, where the tickets would go for about a dollar. That's a dollar without food. But this was a smaller show, like the type from the Vaughn Brothers or the Robbins Brothers, where tickets would sell for just a mere 50 cents. Watching that bear do tricks on stage brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong with the world. The simple show would go on for years, bringing happiness to hundreds of travelers passing through looking for a quick meal. But something bad happened. But it left a permanent impression on one little boy, capturing his imagination in a way that nothing else had. One little boy named Billy. Wait, wait, wait. William Afton is, is that fucking old? Motherfuckers are scared of a motherfucker named Billy. That was his nickname at least, but his parents liked to call him William. William Afton. The bear could dance. It could sing. For decades, William dreamed of recreating that moment of bringing a musical bear to life, but how? William was smart, without a doubt, and he had a keen mind for business, but he wasn't the most creative. How do you make a singing, dancing bear come to life? The best he could do was using rudimentary costumes. William was inspired by the work of Walt Disney, who- Wait. He was inspired by Walt Disney? Holy fuck, it makes sense now. William Afton is a Nazi. Holy shit. No way! How the fuck did he get there? What you guys don't know about? You get you don't know about Walt Disney? The big innovation, suits with five fingers. This allowed the performers wearing the suits to use their natural arms and hands to interact with the guests, as opposed to the older models where the arms would just hang limply by their sides. Finally, with a simple mascot suit, he would be able to realize his childhood dream. He would be able to bring Fred Bear to life, to appeal to the kids, and for copyright reasons. Bro, what's this dorky ass motherfucker? <laughs> reasons. He changed Fred Bear from a realistic brown animal to a cartoonish yellow bear with a purple hat and bow tie. But feeling like one character wasn't enough, he added another friend. A yellow rabbit with a purple vest and matching tie named Bonnie the Bunny. Well, Fred Bear was certainly his first love. Bon I thought Bonnie was blue. This is spring Bonnie. Why is there a different bo- Oh, shit makes no fucking sense. You got spring Bonnie, and you got regular Bonnie, and you got the new Bonnie, and you got the new Bonnie, and the- Oh, bro. Isn't he Spring Bonnie? He's Spring Bonnie, right? He becomes Spring Bonnie, right? That's the whole... I know that. And I do mean scratch. William's hand-sewn costumes were rough with seams and stitches visibly showing, but it was the best that he could do. And you know what? It was just enough. Bonnie and Fred Bear would perform on stage to small but enthusiastic crowds. Finally, he was able to deliver fantasy and fun to all the kids, delighting and inspiring them in the exact way that he had been delighted and inspired so many years ago. And things could have ended there. That could have been the end to his story. It could have been perfect had it not been for one thing. Other people saw the success of his idea and they wanted in. Enter Chica's Party World, a rival restaurant starring performing animal characters. His idea, except they did it better. William huh? William may have been the first, but obviously he wasn't the best. It hurt the prideful William Afton to admit it, but this restaurant was able to do the thing that he always wanted to do. Make the animals actually come to life. All of the performers in this restaurant were robots. Simple metal skeletons that were powered by battery packs. But all of them able to freely turn and talk and dance on their own, no human required. It was like magic. Magic that came from the mind of a brilliant creator named Henry Emily. What kind of name is that? His name is Henry. Motherfucker got two first names. That's been his last name the whole time wait i thought it was henry afton what a stupid ass last name i thought it was henry afton the two fucking videos i've watched i thought his name was henry afton i thought they were brothers henry in some small way had been able to harness the power of life itself afton admired him he was jealous to be sure but he also looked upon this man with awe off to one side of chica's party world was a small cabaret stage featuring an elephant magician on the other a hippo known to ramble on and on that one was more of a joke for the parents but it was the main stage that was for the kids a rocking band of characters featuring a yellow chicken thing with a southern drawl you tell me that was <laughs> That's on the stage. This fucking creepy bitch is on the stage performing for kids. Ain't no way. Named Chica, backed by a band of other country themed characters, including a pig with a banjo, an upbeat frog from the local swimming hole, and a brown bear with a heavy. Where's the frog? Wait, the f there's a frog character, and I never knew about this till now. Where's the frog? Frog is in FNAF 6. Let's go to info, let's go to info. Bear? But bears were his animals. Why not a cow or a horse? Something to fit the country theme a bit better. Why did it have to be a bear? And adding insult to injury, they had the nerve to call this thing Ned Bear. A direct...
copy of his own Fredbear. Whoops, that's gonna leave a mark. No, that was not okay. Afton's jealous admiration turned to hardened bitterness. A bitterness that would only grow over the next couple of years as families continued to choose Chica's party world over Fredbear's. William just couldn't compete with the appeal of the robots. Eventually, his restaurant would go bankrupt, only to get bailed out by, of course, Henry Emily. Another insult, another humiliation that William wouldn't soon forget. 1979, despite being bitter, Afton could- Okay. No way, no way, no way this is all because he was jealous. No way he murdered a bunch of kids because he was jealous of a other animatronic bullshit? No way. Nah, there's gotta be more. There's gotta be more. Couldn't deny that what came next was a period of massive success and expansion. With the two franchises now merged into one, it was the best of both worlds. Afton's ideas with Henry's robotic expertise. The two men decided to launch under a new name, Fred Bear's Family Diner, a pizza chain that would eventually come to feature a mix of humans in performing suits as well as on-stage animatronics. They decided to stick with Fred Bear as the headliner considering the Yellow Bear was easily identifiable as a brand and because he was the original performing animal mascot. Afton appreciated that. Look at Afton's goofy ass face. This new restaurant would also see a mix of characters as the two franchises merged into one, with Pig Patch and Happy Frog performing right alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie. And as part of this one big Fred Bear family, they even got themselves official merch that were released ranging from masks to magnets. The crappy Mr. Hippo fridge magnet? <sighs> That said, not all the characters were winners. The reception to some characters was just mediocre. So they faded away into the dumpster, storage units, and retro budget tech stores of lost nostalgia, waiting for their chance to step back into the limelight if and when a headliner went out of commission. Others, though, would fare much better, like a new pirate fox, as well as a blue guitar playing variant of the yellow Bonnie Bunny. Ultimately, the franchise... Oh. would get so big it would spawn its own cartoon show fred bear and friends business was booming business is booming baby in the end fred bear and bonnie's popularity would be so strong that they would be able to support the fred bear's family diner franchise all on their own while also spinning off a new sister location dedicated to their friend That's the fucking, that's the name of the game. That's the name of one of the games. That's the name of one of the games. Chat's, uh, chat's like, you're going to shake your pants playing sister location. That's the name of the fucking games. You're going to shake your pants. Playing that's one of the, that's the name. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza launched, giving a dedicated home to all this new supporting cast of characters. Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy the Pirate, and of course the headliner, a brown Freddy Fazbear. Business was good, and Afton was happy. Oh, it wasn't booming. Oh, shit. It wasn't booming. It was good. It wasn't booming, though. It did bother him that the one original character that he created, the one that he himself played, Golden Bonnie, got passed over for inclusion in that cartoon show. The only character in the roster of regulars to get ignored for the show, but other than that, things were going smoothly. He had himself a wife, two sons, a daughter. He had a thriving business. And best of all, he was able to learn the craft of robotics from the man that he both loved and hated, Henry. Together, they were constantly pushing the limits of what these characters could do. Because it was quick and easy, new characters introduced into the roster would be given a simple hand-sewn suit with five fingers that any performer could wear. Eventually, Henry would design one of his signature animatronics for that character, utilizing a divided mouth with either a hinge uh. or sliding jaw design. This was the first generation of animatronics. But why stop there? Afton had big ideas. What if the animatronics weren't just locked to the stage, but could freely roam the restaurant and interact with the kids? What if his mascot suits could become animatronics? What if you could use more than just rigid metallic skeletons? Why not experiment with tubes and wires that would give the animatronics fluidity and flexibility while still providing structure? The possibilities for this technology were endless. Who's this goofy motherfucker? <laughs> Who's this goofy bitch with the fucking hand puppet? Hey! <laughs> Afton fell in love with robotics. He had started- Oh, with he started fucking him? Simple singing bear to life, but with robots, he had stumbled across the tools that gave him the ability to control life itself. And thanks to Henry, he was practically speedrunning his way to an engineering degree. And while William wouldn't admit it out loud, one other thing that kept pushing him forward was the desire to beat his former rival. To prove himself smarter and more capable. To surpass the man who everyone else considered Holy to be shit. a visionary genius. But pride cometh before the fall, and tragedy 
Tweety was about to strike. At the end of each of these chunks, I want to break down some of the logical leaps that I made since the more narrative form. Oh, I don't care. I don't care why you made these assumptions. I don't care. No, I don't care about the breakdown. I don't fucking care. I care about the story. I don't care about, hey, if you read this book and look at this part of the page in the little, on the right hand corner, you can see this little part. Nah, I don't fucking care. Business was booming with two. It's Bobby, baby! Two whole restaurant franchises running. Fred Bear's Family Diner and the newly opened Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Together, William and Henry had been able to take the hybrid suit idea and make it into a reality. They called their new invention the Springlock Suit. And fittingly enough, it was symbolic of the partnership between these two men. A human suit as designed by William that could... A Markiplier? become a freestanding Henry style robot. But because it was still new tech with kinks to work out, the rollout was limited, restricted only to the Fred Bear's family diner location. All of this meant that William was busier than ever. He didn't have time to be a full-time parent, so he designed a nanny cam. I thought that was a fucking gun. I ain't got time for my kids. <laughs> system where cameras and speakers were hidden throughout the neighborhood, as well as in his youngest son's favorite toy, psychic friend Fred Bear. I mean, plushy Fred Bear. But since cameras Cameras just weren't enough to raise a kid. He also left childcare duties to his eldest son, Michael. There was just one problem with that. Michael was far from the best babysitter. He tormented his younger brother by jump scaring him with a foxy mask. But not for. And constantly left him behind. William watched all of it from his cameras. Kids would be kids. Tomorrow was another day after all. Except Michael's torment didn't stop. That was William who said that he watched his older brother bully his younger brother and he all he said was tomorrow's another day oh my god father of the year ladies and gentlemen i thought it was the crying kid who just said that i thought he was like crazy he's like tomorrow's another day tomorrow's another day his son oh my god you gotta just go fucking shut the hell up okay why did he have to be the one to take care of this whining crybaby all the time it just wasn't fair it was time that he got even with his brother by playing the ultimate prank a prank that just so happened to be on this crying child's birthday. He and his friends would take his scared little brother and make him do the one thing that he was terrified of doing, getting close to the animatronics. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So the spring lock suits, I just realizing this, I never asked the question. The spring lock suits can act on their own and they can have people in them at the same time. I'm just realizing this because I realized the spring lock suit can have a person in it but the person didn't bite the kid. Kicked and fought, but just as they were putting that small squirming boy up to Fred Bear's lips, the mouth snapped shut. The sensitive spring locks inside the body had been triggered by the boy's movements, and they'd immediately clamp. No, it was his tears, Mad Pat! Shut the fuck up! Oh my God, oh no, his movements. It was his tears! The wriggling stopped. The boy went limp, but it was just a prank. It was meant to be funny. The boy <laughs> there's a camera right there. There's a, there's a camera right there. You're on YouTube. It's it's just a prank. It was taken to the hospital and was immediately given an IV. Flower. Shut the fuck up. No, shut the fuck up. A bitch, did you see this? Boy's movements, and they'd immediately he did not go to the hospital, bro. His head squished like a watermelon. He did not go to the hospital. Flowers and pills filled the nightstand next to his hospital bed, but the damage was too severe. He couldn't recover. As the younger brother's consciousness began to fade, he could hear Michael's last words, a small and flimsy apology. But his father, Williams, through the voice of the Fredbear plush, were a firm and committed promise to a dying son. You're broken. I will put you back together. This would not be the end. What is wrong with this motherfucker? William's son would live again. It would just take time. Time that, right now, he just didn't have. His young son's heart flatlined as the boy faded into the inky unknown of the afterlife. In the aftermath of the tragedy, changes started happening around the restaurants. Kids were now required to wear security wristbands to prevent anyone from getting outside without parental permission. Any kid who approached the exit without permission would have to answer to the security puppet. What? Bro, that's creepy as shit. What? Are you kidding me? You're over here having a great time at Chuck E. Cheese. And they're like, oh, you got to have a wristband on so you can't leave. Do, 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 do. Oh, I should go outside real quick. Uh, maybe I forgot something in the car. Bam, bitch. Marionette on strings that could fly around on rails across the restaurant to stop kids in their tracks. It was William's idea, inspired by Michael constantly leaving the restaurant without his brother. In the wake of Fred Bear's spring lock failure, all the hybrid suits were getting retired, locked away at the nearby Freddy Fazbear location. It was yet another tough pill to swallow after all the hard work that he and Henry had put into them. William Bro, one of the things just murdered a kid. I'm fucking pissed. They're putting my they're putting my bear in the closet. Bro, it just murdered your child. 
Grow up! William would eventually bury the boy's small body in a remote location out in the woods right alongside his drive into and out of work every day. The death of this- Whoa, 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 whoa! We're just Back making a sub- Whoa, 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 I have watched a different video that said that this could be the mom's grave. Well, hold on, now we're saying it's the little boy's grave? But wait, didn't the little boy break out of the window to go see the mom's grave? Whoa, nah, 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 you're wrong! But wait, it's just a theory. Someone's full of shit. Boy sent the family spiraling. His wife, crippled with grief, was so distraught. We're calling this the wife now? Matt, Pat, what are you doing to me? And you guys want me to watch different theories. Oh my fucking God, now my brain is... Oh, what? I hate you guys. Oh my God, she's bald. Complaining of seeing hallucinations of a golden bear standing outside of his window. The boy was so racked with guilt that he was convinced that he was being haunted by the ghost of his brother stuck inside the suit that took his life. The suit's three-toed feet digging into the wet earth. The words, it's me ringing through Michael's ears. Some nights, Michael would even go so far as to break out of his room to check the gravesite and ensure that What? And my brain's all over the place. My brain, my brain is all over the place. My my brain is all over the place. I know it's a different theory, but this theory is fucking crazy. That his brother was still there. As for William himself, he disappeared into his work and his drinks. Junior's, the local bar, wasn't far from his son's gravesite. He found himself going there more and more frequently, spending longer uh. and longer amounts of time there. The so the one theory we saw, he drunk a lot because his wife is dead and his kid broke out to go look at the grave. But now in this theory, it's uh, the son that dies and William is depressed and drinks and Henry's the one who breaks out. It still makes it con it, it makes sense. But wait, if we're looking at the timeline, what did the other guy say? Because di the other guy said like some shit that this has to happen after this certain event. Michael, not Henry. Dude, whatever, whatever. You know what I'm talking about, okay? I don't care if I say the wrong name. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, he puts an exclamation at the end. Okay, I'll look at the exclamation at the end because this one doesn't make sense to me. Bar gave him a place to think, to remember, to reflect and stew on how Henry had stolen his idea for an animal-themed restaurant. Bro, stop dick sucking Henry, bro. Your kid is dead and it's your fault. How they'd cut his character out of the cartoon when everyone else was there. How Henry had humiliated him by buying him out of bankruptcy. And now, now there was his son. Henry had taken his son from him. The robot. Whoa, we're blaming Henry. Bitch, it's your bear, huh? This is your bear, the bear you loved in 1930? No, no, we're not blaming Henry. William ordered one more drink, but it was one too many. The bar turned him out and told him to go home. But William didn't go home. Drunk and angry, William raced back to the restaurant to give Henry a piece of his mind, only to find someone else waiting. Henry's daughter, Charlie, locked outside of the building, bullied. He's laughing at her through the window. Fine, some other problem to fix. But then Afton got an idea. A beautifully awful idea. This. This was his chance to get back at the man that had humiliated him all those years ago. Henry had killed his business. And now Henry's robotic suit had killed his son. It was time for William to do some killing of his own. Let Henry feel what it's like to have something you love get ripped away. While parties continued inside the walls of the pizzeria, William attacked Charlie in the back alley. It felt good. He felt... Free. The years of resentment and bitterness trapped in his heart finally released in a moment of pure unapologetic evil. He would make Henry hurt like he hurts. And in that moment, William became a killer. He dropped Charlie's lifeless body and drove home, forced to confront his family problems later that night, appalled, but also a little excited by what he had just done. Charlie's death would remain on the books as a random act of violence. And though Henry had suspicions about- Okay, we knew this already. Okay. I, I know I looked surprised, but I was kind of like, it's fine. But William, there was no physical evidence. Nothing that could link him back to the crime. In the weeks that followed, Fred Bear's family diner would close for good. Two high-profile deaths around the restaurant with two grieving owners in such a short period of time was just too much bad press to handle. Besides, Freddy Fazbear's was still open, and it was the newer restaurant anyway. All the equipment from the diner, including the old yellow suits and security puppet, would get retired to that location. And there they would sit for two uneventful years. The rest of 1983 and 19. 
1984 were spent quietly grieving. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and the new cast of characters were a hit. The tragic memories of their yellow predecessors quickly faded. Afton kept a low profile and buried himself in work and research, quickly reaching Henry's level of engineering and e True. Business is no longer booming. And while Henry slowed down to grieve, Afton kept going. Even starting his own company, Afton Robotics, for all those pet projects that were a little bit too experimental for the regular operations of the pizzeria. The first of these experimental projects was a secret workshop under his house, a veritable bunker, which allowed him to work while still monitoring his kids via hidden security cameras. One, nine, eight, three. A passcode that served as a constant reminder of why the cameras were so important. Why he was down there in the first place. This mm -hmm. was all to fulfill the promise that he had made to his son, right? I will put you back together. This was for him. All for him, right? But cameras weren't enough. He needed to solve the runaway Michael problem. He had to keep him in the house. He couldn't have another one of his kids wind up dead inside of an animatronic suit. So why not run a little experiment on Michael? You see, all this work with Henry had gotten Afton to start learning more about life. Robots the human mind and what a fallible machine we as humans were our reality is so easy to manipulate with a few sensory deceptions deceptions like it's sound with fuck. just a few Holy sounds shit. he had discovered that he could alter a person's vision he could transform blank smooth plastic robots into lumbering twisted nightmares nightmares far scarier nightmare than nightmare nightmare than he could create with actual materials they would appear organic rotting putrid terrifying these would be his means of keeping his son Michael in the house where he belonged. Was it a Wait, wait! What? I thought the nightmare animatronics were to scare- Oh my god! I thought the nightmare animatronics were to scare, um, the little one, the crying kid. Now, Michael is the one being scared by these? Bro, how old is Michael? Look at his fucking room! No, that doesn't make any sense. No, 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 no. That doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? No, that doesn't- no, no, no. It's just a theory. That's a shit theory. Nah, nah, nah. Because if FNAF 4 in the cutscenes, you are the crying kid. You're the crying kid. So why would in the game you would be Michael? That doesn't make any fucking sense. That's so dumb. No. No! Trauma. Trauma makes you go fucking sit in your little in your little brother's room? Fuck no. I'm gonna keep watching it. But now I'm pissed extreme maybe but then again this was the boy who had killed his son he would make him sorry and so michael would grow up not only dealing with the memories of his own guilt the hospital room the pills the flowers the death of his brother but also facing literal nightmares illusions created by whoa wait the flowers wait wait now the flowers got me hold on but what creator of this game oh my god he gave, gave him a little kid's room this guy th this guy looks 15 16 he looks 15 16 they gave him a little fucking little kid's room with toys all over the ground that doesn't make Bruh. how old is michael do we know how old he is did they ever say how old he is he's like 12 he does not look 12. Michael would never forget these either. Years later, as a security guard, he would still draw pictures of them inside of his logbook. But all of these extra projects meant that his home life suffered even more. He was an absent father and a non-existent- So wait, were they real or not? Cause like how- wait, hold on, hold on, wait. Were they real? The nightmare animatronics? No. So how did he even do these illusions? With sounds? With fucking sounds? I'm listening. That's one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever heard. That is... No, nah, that is fucking stupid. I'm sorry. That's lame as shit. See, if he drunked him, that'd make more sense, right? Because then, oh, what the fuck am I seeing? You know, that'd make more sense. But nah. <laughs> you know, like, shut the fuck up. No, dude. No, 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 no. The other one makes way more sense. Why? Because that's a little kid. You know, it's a little kid and it makes sense. He's fucking scared because his older brother, Michael, keeps scaring him. That one makes way more sense than this bullshit. But all of these extra projects meant that his home life suffered even more. He was an absent father and a non-existent husband, leaving his wife cold and alone. Why do you hide inside your wall? Is that the wife? When there is music in my halls All I see is an empty room No more joy, an empty tomb 
And despite her repeated demands that he leave his office and engage with the family, he refused time and time again, leaving her no choice but to leave. You burned down my house? You call that a house? It was like a morgue in there. You need to see your son. The baby isn't mine. Well, how's this? I'm keeping the diamond ring. And through it all, there was one lingering feeling. William wasn't done. He had gotten a taste of what it felt like to be unleashed. What it felt like to be free. Charlie's murder had unlocked something in him. And he wanted more. June 26th, 1985. Putting on the golden bonnie suit, he lured children one by one to the back room of the pizzeria when no one was looking. At first, he was cautious. He would lure them with promises of cake and cookies. He told them that their dog had died. He would ask for... Hey, kid. Hey kid, come back here. Your fucking dog's dead. <laughs> Never truly forget your first. I was the first. I have seen everything. But where to hide the bodies? He couldn't sneak out. Someone would see him. He had to hide them in a place where they'd never be found and where they'd never leave the building. They had to be stuffed. Stuffed inside of the suits. Mm -hmm. No one maintained those things anyway except for him. And so Susie would go into Chica. Fritz, Jeremy, and Gabriel would come next. But it was easy. It was too easy. And with each little life he snuffed out, his lies got bigger. Their house was burning. They're just being kidnapped. Until the last one where all pretense was off. He let himself get violent. Too violent. I'll I'll just wait for him after school, throw a bag over his head, hit him with a shovel, and drag him into the back of my car. What was that? Who said that? Far more bloody and broken than any of the others. He'd let himself go too far. That one? That one he shouldn't have killed. With no more active animatronics left, he shoved the body into the one suit that remained- Oh, the most brutal- Kill Golden Freddy. Backstage, the long forgotten yellow Fred Bear, now broken and discolored with age. Broken, like Cassidy was broken, like his son was broken. Right, there's two kids in there. There's two kids. There's Cassidy and his son. Right, 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 right. They're both in there. Was reported on this disappearance, naming the whole thing the missing children's incident. Police would even charge William with the crimes after finding security footage of the golden mascot suit luring kids to the back, but they couldn't convict him. They had no bodies, and his face had been hidden behind the mascot suit the entire time. What they had was circumstantial at best and so he walked away a free man but henry knew the truth in these murders he saw his daughter charlie all over again so he threw afton out of the company and shuttered the doors to the old pizzeria henry would keep the franchise quiet oh hey you murdered my daughter i'm gonna just throw you out of the company pog as fuck holy call the cops for two years. This would not happen again. This could not happen again. How could he protect the kids? Finally, he developed a solution. He would implement an even more extreme security system in the form of new animatronics. Toy animatronics. How are, they, how are these security systems, bitch? They got fucking Glocks? But these guys, these were special. They were a new breed of robot with facial recognition abilities. But most importantly, they're all tied into some kind of criminal database so they can detect a predator a mile away. All the original animatronics, now withered with age, were moved to the new location. With a plan in place, it was time to try once more. The year was 1987, and the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was making headlines in local newspapers. Headlines that just so happened to catch the attention of William Afton. Freddy's was back and without him? That was his idea. His character. Henry was, yet again, trying to cut him out of the picture. No. As long as these restaurants stayed open, William would always come back. I know this because he's, he, correct me if I'm wrong, Fuck, holy but shit. he is the security guard in FNAF 2. He's the first one. Right, right. He's, he's the first, okay, right. He was day shift, but it wasn't FNAF 2. It was FNAF 2. You replaced him after you quits. Right. Right, right, right. But it was that. So, God, no, idiot. No, you're the idiot. I knew what I was talking about. I know my shit. Afton would go back, not as an owner or co founder. He would go back in the one place that they would least. They ain't do fucking background checks? Suspect him. A lowly day shift security guard. And there it was. Buried in the back of parts and services mixed in with the old withered animatronics was the golden rabbit. With the yellow security badge still on his chest, he used his crank to pull open the spring locks. It was time for Bonnie to give an encore performance. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. Now none of them are acting right. Uh, from what I understand, the building is on lockdown. No one is allowed in or out, you know, especially concerning any previous employees. When we get it all sorted out, we may move you to the day shift. A position just became available. 1987, five more kids. He didn't know what felt better. Getting back into the suit after two long years of waiting or knowing.
Huh? He murders five kids. He gets kicked out of the company. Henry starts a new business with new animatronics. And for William to get back at Henry, he murders five more kids. Did I get that correct? Yup. Boy, what the fuck? Knowing how devastating this would be to Henry the next morning, he didn't even try to hide his crime this time, just meant more blood on Henry's hands. He'd failed to protect the- Oh, okay, he's trying to pin it on Henry. Okay, okay, okay. Kids again. The restaurant had only been open for a few weeks, but William was sure that this would get it to close. Good, if he couldn't have Freddy's, no one would. Whenever a new pizzeria opened, he would be there. But as he sat in his bunker, something else started to linger in William's mind. He had seen something strange. The old Old withered animatronics, they had been wandering around the building, spurred on by the puppet. It was almost like those old robots were trying to save the kids. Save them? They couldn't, obviously, but still, how were they moving? It was almost like they had been given life somehow. Did he have something to do with it's that? The following day, the fuck. news would Holy report a security shit. guard getting bitten by one of the animatronics during the day shift. Was that bite meant for... For him? William's curiosity was stronger now than his bloodlust. He had to learn more, but how? There was no way he'd ever be able to get inside another Freddy's pizzeria. Heck, there was practically no way a Freddy's would ever open again. He needed to create his own pizzeria. Due to the massive success, and even more so the unfortunate closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender in children's entertainment. Circus Baby's Pizza World. This. Right. This would be the place where he could continue his work. No longer right. just murdering, experimenting. He needed more for <laughs> kids, and he needed them alive. And knowing that he couldn't show his face on the restaurant floor, he needed a way of remotely capturing his victims and preserving them for his work. With that goal in mind, he designed a new breed of animatronic. Their endoskeletons fluid and flexible. He equipped them with sound lures that could mimic voices. They could isolate children. They could incapacitate and contain them with zero direct input from him. It was brilliant. He was brilliant. Far beyond the simple bars and wires of Henry's designs. And the characters he chose for this were uniquely his. His new roster wasn't going to be tainted by Henry's disgusting barnyard bird. Instead, it was back. They're uniquely his. <laughs> to his characters, his creations, Freddy, Bonnie, Foxy, as well as two special ones. The first, Ballora, was an homage to the woman who left him. Now, she it's would never leave him fuck. again. Holy the second, shit. the titular baby, was designed with his baby in mind, Elizabeth, his youngest child. She would always be daddy's little girl, the one that listened to him, the one that obeyed until the day that she didn't. Daddy, why won't you let me play with mm -hmm. her? She's so pretty and shiny. Mm-hmm. She disobeyed. She didn't listen. Left alone with baby, she got too close. The animatronic ripped in half and swallowed her whole. A scared and confused child fading into eternal darkness. By the time Afton found her, it was too late. She was gone. He immediately canceled the launch of Circus Babies under the guise of a gas leak. But wait, as he sat there at the foot of the stage, he noticed that something was different. The eye color of the robot had changed. Babies They're green! With blue eyes, but now they were emerald green. The same mm -hmm. color as Elizabeth's. Was mm -hmm. she in there? Could this all be connected to the free-moving animatronics that he had seen at Freddy's? He had to know more. His mourning turned to excitement. He had to return to where it all started. 1993. Pathetic. Damn. A big time skip. Pathetic. This place was pathetic. Henry had clearly tried to reopen one final time with those old original animatronics from so long ago, but William's damage to the brand had been permanent. These things stank of death. They hadn't been washed in decades. But even if they had, nothing could wash away the stink of murder that haunted these halls. One night, then another, then another. William repeatedly snuck into the old, broken restaurant to lure the living animatronics to him, one by one dismantling them, robbing mm -hmm. them of their endoskeletons. The metal had to be the secret it had to contain the remnants of life itself remnants there's the stupid shit but he had to know for sure leaping out of a room that was invisible to the animatronics programming he dragged the oversized robotic skeletons back to his underground workshop back to where circus baby watched on with glowing curious eyes eyes that somehow felt alive not knowing what else to do william melted the robotic parts down five animatronic endoskeletons reduced down to one silvery puddle of goo Could he wait he killed wait I didn't know he killed Golden Freddy, too. Wait, he... So he melted all of... Wait, what? When did this happen? I, I, I knew he dismantled them. I didn't know he melted them. No, no, he got the OG4. Five animatronic endo... He says five animatronics, and is that not Golden Freddy, or am I crazy? Oh, Matt, Pat, your theory fucking 
sucks, dude. It's reduced down to one silvery puddle of goo. Could he transfer this living metal to his own creations? He had to try. He picked up a syringe and filled it with the molten metal and injected the goo into Funtime Freddy's twisted, wiry endoskeleton. And suddenly, the coils came to life. Like snakes writhing in a pile, what had once been cold, lifeless metal moved and jolted on its own. He'd done it! He had unlocked the secret to life itself. Except something was clearly wrong. The movements were erratic. They were violent, angry. Baby didn't act this way. She had been calm, collected. This was clearly something else. Something mindless and frantic. Perhaps by mixing the souls and then portioning them out, he had created incomplete beasts. He would need to keep testing to truly understand it. He needed more of this remnant. As he searched the old pizzeria one more time for any remaining scraps of metal, the ghosts attacked. His past victims come to collect their due, all led by Cassidy. The five lined up and blocked the door, and Afton's mind reeled. The scientific implications of this were incredible. Ghosts, real ghosts that he could see all standing against him. But what could they do? What couldn't they do? He panicked as Cassidy approached. How do you stop something that's already dead? Maybe with the thing that resulted in their death in the first place. Wait, 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 wait. hold on. The crying child and Cassidy are both in Golden Freddy. So when he dismantles Golden Freddy, only Cassidy is in front of him. Where's the crying kid? Did he murder the soul of the crying kid? Or where where's the crying kid? See, we're kind of like forgetting about it. They're all there. Cassidy's just leading them. Wrong. There is Cassidy, and then there's the other four kids for the other four animatronics. Where is the sixth kid? Where is the crying kid? Man, you're crazy. I... This shit doesn't make any fucking sense. He would get into his suit like old times. He would regain his power over them just like the day that they died. He was the genius. He was the one in the suit. He was the one in charge. The spring lock snapped into place. Maybe it was his frantic movements. Maybe it was the leaky abandoned restaurant. Maybe it was just fate coming to collect its due. He didn't know. The only thing he did know was that his brain was suddenly filled with searing white hot pain as hundreds of metallic pins and gears stabbed into his body from all sides. All he could do was collapse, blood slowly oozing out of the suit and pooling onto the floor around him. It couldn't end like this. It wouldn't end like this. His work was unfinished. Unable to move, his only option was to survive. To live to keep living it took days lying in his own blood but eventually someone found him a security guard making a normal report when he saw the animatronics torn apart in the middle of the party room floor it caused him to file an immediate report of a break-in an owner would have to come in and claim the damage and who else would it be other than henry hope jumped in afton's heart henry would see him they were partners after all he would be the one to help save him to get him out of this suit to relieve him from this tremendous pain henry entered the secret room his eyes fell on afton sitting there in the pool of red and henry saying nothing turned and walked away but how's he know how's he know it's after you can't see his face he's not an idiot right because if i see a bloody bunny man on the ground i'm gonna assume it's fucking william right okay yeah just to inform all employees that due to budget restrictions the previously mentioned safe rooms are being sealed at most locations including this one. Nothing is being taken out beforehand, so if you left anything inside, then it's your own fault. Management also requests that this room not be mentioned to family, friends, or insurance representatives. And so there Afton would sit, hanging on. We see him wear the suit, but Henry does it. I What is, how does we see him do it? Have anything to do with that? Okay, so most of this is things that we already knew. Stuff that's been established and re-established time and time again by the games. That said, there are two things that I absolutely have to address. The first and biggest is the placement of sister location. Or more specifically, Elizabeth's death. To me, evidence in games seems to suggest that it was meant to come before the crying child's death in 1983. The biggest clue to this is that the crying child saw something. Remember what you saw is the phrase that's repeated over over and over again by psychic friend Fredbear, aka William Afton speaking through a walkie-talkie in the Fredbear plushie's stomach. But what did he see? Well, I think we can tell based on how the nightmare animatronics are vision- What? 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 How does that make any sense? What? The nightmare animatronics were for Michael! Mad Pat said that! But now they're for the crying kid? What? That- 
No! No! I'm pissed! They have mouths in their stomachs, just like baby ripping in half at the waist to swallow a kid. There's also the empty girl's room, one presumably left behind by a dead sister. And lastly, it explains why he's scared, and more specifically, why Afton wants him scared. He needs his kids to stay away from the animatronics. He doesn't want them getting too close, because the last time one of his kids got too close to a robot, his daughter died. That's then why he sets up the nightmares, to scare both Mike and the crying child away from the animatronics from that point forward. That's why books like the character encyclopedia- Wait, 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 wait. So why is he saying this? Wait, so wait, is, th is the little girl dying- Oh my god, what? outright suggests that we play as the crying child in FNAF 4. That's why he has a nanny cam following the crying child everywhere, so he can keep tabs on his kids when they're out of his sight. He can't let another Elizabeth situation happen. The death of Elizabeth also gives William Afton extra motivation for killing. He's a grieving father. His daughter was taken away from him, so Charlie should die as well. He's lashing out at the world after losing his kids. And again, we know that at least one of his children had to have died prior to Charlie's death, based on the mound of dirt that we see in Midnight Motorist. It also allows circus babies to open and close earlier in the timeline, which is how you wind up with Funtime Foxy appearing as Mangle in the FNAF 2 location. Basically, Elizabeth dying first has everything it needs to fit, except for the most important thing, the murder weapon. Why would Afton be building an animatronic with a giant claw in its stomach so early in the timeline? At this point, he just has no motive. It just doesn't make sense prior to 1983. At this point in the story, he hasn't killed anyone, and we know for a fact that the missing children's incident is 1985. So Elizabeth's death coming before any of those events just doesn't work. Hence why I placed it where I did in the narrative timeline. Afton's death here is also a bit tricky. We know that he returned to the FNAF 1 location to break down the original. So that theory was debunked. But can we explain why Michael is the one getting scared and not the crying child? You guys said wait till the end, he'll explain it. He's clearly not explaining that part. They both got scared. No, 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 no. No, 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 shut the, no, shut the fuck up. No, 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 shut the fuck up. No, 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 you're wrong. You're wrong. If you watch the fucking video, he says this during this theory. He scares both kids it's in this theory, shit. but I'm then later he life. debunks it. He said, no, this theory is wrong. But earlier in the fucking video, he says the nightmares were made to scare Michael. You are wrong. I am clearly paying attention. You guys are not. Oh my God. I'm gonna go grab a drink. I, I'm getting a fucking headache, bro. Why are you mad? Because I am. I, I need to prove to you guys. You guys are like, Puffer, you're wrong. Puffer, you're wrong. No, I'm right. You're wrong. Fuck you. Are you guys really arguing with each other whether I'm right or wrong? I'm correct. Bro's still mad. I'm fucking pissed, bro. Let's get it. As we left him, William was springlocked, bleeding to death behind a secret wall. Gone, but certainly not forgotten, as we're about to see in today's video. Today, we're finishing up chapter two of our story, wrapping up the Afton era. Over the next six pages, we switch our focus to the other main character of the franchise, Mike, a young boy dealing with the fallout of a stupid childhood decision with tragic consequences. A young man whose life is best described as... Boy, why you look so dorky? <laughs> damage caught in the blast radius of William's whirlwind of destruction. William still wasn't back. Weird. Michael knew his father sometimes traveled for work, disappearing for days on end, but usually there was some sort of notice, a phone call, a post-it, something. It's not like Michael and his father were close, far from it, but as a household of two suffering men coping with years of loss, there was at least some element of communication between the two of them. They were united by a name and a shared pain. This time though, things felt different. William had left nothing. His absence was longer. There were no check-ins, no updates, just silence. Something had happened. If there was one thing Michael knew about his father, it was that he had contingencies, safety checks, backup plans. His father was a careful and guarded man. He held his cards close to his chest, and as such, William had prepared him in the event that something like this ever happened. Normally, his father kept his home office locked, but in the event of an unexpected, prolonged absence, Michael had been instructed to enter his father's office and look behind an empty set of shelves mounted in the corner of the room. Rolling his eyes, Michael entered the office. Never fully understood how William was able to spend so many hours of his days locked up in here. There was just nothing to do. Most of this place was empty. He dragged himself over to the shelf in the corner, expecting to find an emergency contact list, a family safety deposit box. But what he actually found there was completely unexpected. Father, it's me, Michael. 
I did it. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. The shelf swung open and revealed a giant industrial elevator. One that led straight sister's look sister location. But but that was impossible. Hidden inside his childhood home was a secret entrance to an enormous underground science lab. Bro, brain dead are you, bro? You didn't know this the whole time. It, it didn't make any sense. He's a fuck. How brain dead are you? He works on animatronics and you didn't know that. Seriously, it didn't make any sense. And yet here it was, mapped directly underneath the floor plan of the house that he'd grown up in, lost his brother in, been tortured in. Michael thought- There it is again. They're talking about it again. It didn't torture the crying kid. It only tortured fucking Michael, apparently. That he'd known his father, a prideful, sad, angry man with petty everyday problems, but clearly he'd been living with a stranger this entire time. His father had secrets. Suddenly the days of William being locked inside of his office made sense. He'd been here the entire time. Where was here though? Was this circus baby? You just said, bro, he tortured both. You didn't even spell tortured right. You fucking child, shut the hell up. The Circus Baby restaurant always did seem to be a deeply personal project for father. A failure of his that cut unusually deep, especially after that first location had to be closed prematurely due to the gas leaks. After that day, father really did seem to change, to lose himself even more in his work. Clearly the entrance he had found was some sort of secret back way into the facility, one that required crawling through vents to navigate. His father had been working here, but in secret. Why? And that's when he found her. At the end of the facility, Circus Baby. His father's pride and joy. Except something was different about her. She wasn't like the others. The way she talked. The stories she told. This wasn't just a robot. She was alive, somehow. And not only was she alive, she also felt familiar. There is something bad inside of me. I'm broken. I can't be fixed. Will you help me? Was this... His sister? William's baby girl? But how? Why? What was this place? He dug around some old files and found blueprints outlining the features of these animatronics. Storage containers, voice mimicking, parental tracking. And was that a child in Freddy's stomach? Was his father collecting and experimenting on kids? Were all the rumors that he'd heard throughout his past actually true? That the animatronics came to life at night? That there were murders done in all the pizzerias? That his father had somehow been the prime suspect in in all of it so yes suddenly michael's mind flashed back to his persistent nightmares throughout his childhood had he been experimented on too tears stung in his eyes as anger fear and confusion filled his body his father's secrets were pouring out william wasn't just a lame overworked father he was a monster toying with life itself suddenly everything clicked he frantically looked around the room blinking human heads on poles staring back at him green eyes his sister blue eyes his brother closed eyes his mom all just staring expectantly these were meant to be human william was working down here trying to make believable humans literally rebuilding the family that they had both lost the small little girl robots with their british accent ah! in the hallways of this underground facility suddenly took on a whole new context i am in there is this the same person were those boy ah oh, hell no i'm not playing this game meant to be his sister a replacement for her a clone was william building clones of his sister they seemed the to know fuck? him after all to react to his presence they were all there they didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. He always did have a bit of a resemblance to his father. Michael's mind reeled as the reality of his world crumbled to dust. No, no, he had to get them out of there. If this really was his sister, heck, if any of these things were human, souls, whatever remnant of the humans that they once were, they need- He said it again, he said fucking remnant. ...needed to be rescued. They always put us back inside. There's nowhere for us to hide here. Led by the voice of Circus Baby, he marched through the now empty halls of the Funtime Auditorium. He would lead them. He would protect them. And finally, he would be able to forgive himself for the killing of his brother so many years. You are in the scooping room now. The scooper only hurts for a moment. Scooper? That violent extraction arm? Michael had seen that one in the pile of blueprints. Something about heat rendering the magical silver metal inside useless. In reality, prior to getting himself spring-locked and put behind the wall, William's methods had become increasingly sophisticated. But oh, I just re oh my god, it just clicked to me that the reason William hadn't came home in a while is because he was fucking locked in the spring trap. God damn it, I just realized that. A mechanized arm that could infuse new bodies with a soul. William could finally give and take away life. The only thing he needed were the bodies. But William wasn't the only one looking for bodies, as Michael was about to learn. But if we looked like you, then we could hide. 
If we looked like you, then we would have somewhere to go. Michael was going to be the hero to help these animatronics, all right. He was going to help the haunted tubes and wires of these animatronics escape, just not in the way that he anticipated. His sister had lied to him. Another game of pretend. The scooper plowed forward, digging its extraction arm into his body. As he heard his bones ripping through his flesh, Michael blacked out. But something is wrong with me. I should be dead, but I'm not. For the next several months, Michael's life was not his own. He was forced to comply with the tangle of wires and spirits that lived inside of him. His body felt like an overfilled balloon begging to burst as day by day, week by week, his flesh began to sag and discolor. He was a walking, talking, rotting corpse, alive but wishing he wasn't. He was a puppet, a walking shell. And while he did his best to conceal his fate, there was only so much <laughs> Oh boy, what the hell? The entity in his innards would eventually leave, but by that point, the damage had been done. His decaying flesh stank, turning him into a literal purple guy. But still, even with no bones, even with rotting purple flesh and begging to die, Michael continued to live. That silvery metal remnant injected by the scooper meant that he couldn't die. His anger also refused to die. What he had seen down there in his sister's location had rocked him to his core. His father had killed and captured dozens. His experiments had killed his sister and then tortured him throughout all his childhood. He was actively trying to build human replicants. He didn't know where his father was, but Michael knew that he was out there somewhere. I've been living in shadows. There is only one thing left for me to do now. I'm going to come find you. Michael had to correct for the sins of his father. He had to make things right. Michael would burn Fazbear Entertainment to the ground. I mean, what else could you do when your skin was permanently purple? Michael's strategy was simple. He would apply for night security guard positions at the old defunct pizzeria locations. That way, no one ever had to see him or smell him during his shift. And all these old, shuttered locations did need guards. Teenage vandals and squatters were always looking to get inside these abandoned buildings, and yet no one ever really wanted to work an overnight graveyard shift unless they were practically out of options. Enter Mike. One by one, he would take on the job of security guard, changing his name each time to ensure that no one was able to follow his paper trail. Once inside, he could tamper with the animatronics and figure out how they worked, writing about... But didn't William melt it? Okay, it's a different one. Okay. Okay, okay. ...about his experiences in his security logbook. Well, there, he would listen to the old tapes where upper management awkwardly welcomed new recruits to their summer jobs, even though he was working there nowhere near the summer months. He heard the gory details of his father's franchise from the outsiders looking in, confused and afraid about what was happening in the walls around him. Sometimes, he would see his brother in the form of the Golden Freddy suit. It's me appearing on the walls around him. Except now, there was something else there. He was no longer alone. Another angrier presence was also in the suit, as if two spirits Wait, what? Wait, how's Fred Golden Freddy here? I thought he melted Golden Freddy. What? I thought he melted Golden Freddy. Melt came after. Oh, you're so fucking wrong. It's crazy. It did not come after. Why would they? No, it's in timeline. We are following the timeline. Hallucinations? All right, hold on. It's me appearing with happy details of his father's franchise from the outsiders looking in, confused and afraid about what was happening in the walls around them. Sometimes he would see his brother in the form of the Golden Freddy suit. It's me appearing on the wall. What? Does that mean he saw Golden Freddy or he's just hallucinating Golden Freddy? I guess, I guess he does hallucinate a lot. Ugh. There was something else there. He was no longer alone. Another angrier presence was also in the suit. But how we, how convenient it is that he fucking sees the hallucination of Golden Freddy and somehow both kids are in Golden Freddy. But how does he know that somehow? That makes no fucking sense. As if two spirits were forced to share the same body and golden but it's a hallucination in his mind freddy would attack him now it was aggressive its vengeance wanted to lash out at anyone with the afton name anyone who wore a security guard outfit over time mike worked his way through the old restaurants the original pizzeria the bigger better freddy fazbears he spent weeks there looking for clues as to his father's whereabouts and each time at the end of his week shift he would then set the location on fire remnant can't survive high temperatures after all so burning away whatever spirit laden animatronics that still existed inside seemed like a winning strategy all this he took them apart and melted the inside metal guts, not the suits. The suits have new metal put in. It didn't look like he melted the metal part. It looked like he melted this. I know he talked about the metal part. Doesn't the metal have the souls? Right. Bro oh my God, I don't know. 
That would make sense. See, the one thing that that first time chatter just said makes sense. Everything else you guys said makes no fucking sense. It's after Puffer. No, clearly it's not, dumb bitch. That's what the scooper was made for. The scooper was made to get the metal exoskeleton out. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. I Okay, that makes more sense. So the suit was still there. I guess that makes sense because he left the suits on the ground. Oh! That makes sense. That makes fucking sense. Okay. 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 Because when he was melting the suits, it didn't make sense to me. Because the suits were on the ground. But he just didn't... He didn't use... He did pictures. Okay. The pictures were the suits. But he didn't do the pictures of the metal active skeleton. If he did pictures of the metal active skeleton, it would have made more sense for me. But it would all be worth it in the end. The goal was to eventually, eventually stumble across the one location. The one job that would finally reunite him with his father. Little did Mike know that that day would come sooner than he expected. 2023. An advertisement came across Mike's TV. Fazbear Frights. A new horror attraction inspired by the awful... Michael lived till 2023. He's literally a purple dude and he has no flesh and he somehow survived till 2023. How in God's fucking name? Remnant. Rem oh, it's all remnant. People looking to make a quick buck off the tragedy of others, off his own family. This wasn't a joke or entertainment. Regardless, he had to be a part of it. If this team was combing through his family's history, they might stumble across something that could be useful. And if his father was truly still alive as he suspected, there would be no way he wouldn't show up here. Maybe finally. Finally, this could be the final chapter in his family's marathon of tragedy. Mike applied for the job and was immediately handed the keys. Years of doing this had taught him that security guards rarely received thorough security checks. They also liked how creepy Mike looked. They thought it was a costume on theme for the job what little they knew hey hey glad you came back for another night i promise it'll be a lot more interesting this time for weeks there was nothing but just as mike considered giving up he received the an f3 call that he'd been waiting for for years you're not gonna believe this we found one a real one could this finally be him sure enough there he was. William inside his iconic golden Bonnie Springlock suit. Only now it was green and decaying with age. And there they were. A small family of broken men finally reunited. It's been a long time, Dad. Mike had always struggled with the phantoms of his past haunting him. But now, all the animatronics he'd encountered over the past months hopping from pizzeria to pizzeria suddenly sprang to life. Shit, that makes sense. Fuck. Oh, shit, that makes sense. Oh my god, so the other theory is wrong. That makes fucking sense. Oh my god. Oh, he cooked. He fucking cooked. Oh, that makes sense. But why is he in a little boy's room, bro? That's not his room. Oh my god. Then FNAF 4 makes no sense. It would seem that William's mere presence had put the spirits on high alert. Ultimately, they were harmless, more annoying than anything else. But there was one that felt different from the others. One that was more than just a mere phantom. The security puppet. If he looked at the cameras at just the right moment, he could see it floating there through the halls. He could even see its reflection in the water pooled on the ground. It would seem like... He wasn't the only one there on a mission. While he was dealing with Springtrap, Michael assumed that this one was likely dealing oh. with the spirits of this place, finally setting him to rest. And so wait, the spirit? Wait, I never saw the spirit in FNAF 3. The spirit was actually there, and it was real in FNAF 3? When I played, I didn't see it. And in that moment, he felt the air around him release, like pressure being let out of a bottle. The building sighed, as if five spirits had finally been allowed to move on. He had the sense that his brother was a part of them. He rigged the wiring inside the building to misfire, and the dry, desiccated wall erupted in flames it is finished or so you think except it was not somehow through sheer force of will afton remained he had survived and mike would need to find a new way <laughs> of finishing off his father luckily the solution would present itself later that year you are now the face of the newly rebranded freddy fazbear's pizza fazbear entertainment as a brand had been closed for years william had been stuck in a suit in a wall the only person who legally could bring the franchise back was henry but he'd largely pulled out of the franchise around the time of his father's disappearance something was up surely this had to be some kind of a trick, right? Mike, doing what he did best, applied for a franchise and immediately got the job. There was just one thing out of the ordinary. Paragraph four. If you are playing this tape, that means that not only have you been checking outside at the end of every shift, 
as you were instructed to do, but also that you have found something that meets the criteria of your special obligations under paragraph 4. No employment contract he'd ever signed required him to keep special lookout for independently moving animatronics outside the restaurant. Now he knew something was up here. Henry was luring them all back. Rather than trying to go to them, like Mike had done for years, Henry was doing the opposite. He was putting them all under the same roof. He was finishing them off for good. Mike knew this wasn't meant to be a restaurant. It was meant to be a prison, a containment vessel, a locked box meant to trap them all in so they could finally end the madness. It took a few nights, but eventually everyone was there. His father, the puppet, the robot spaghetti that had once violated his body, and his sister, now hopelessly devoted to serve the man that had once gotten her killed. It was time. He had been instructed to seal the doors and leave, but while he locked everything down, he didn't move on. If this was truly meant to be the end, if the remnant needed to be washed away, he needed to be a part of that. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still and give up your spirits. They don't belong to Wait, there were two fires? Oh, what the fuck? To you. For most of you, I believe there is peace and perhaps more waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. And with that... Damn, that bar was fire. The Afton legacy died with all of them trapped inside of a literal box. As the flames danced around the office, Mike, for the first time in decades, was happy. But William wasn't gone yet. Although the darkest pit of hell was open and waiting for him, something or someone wouldn't allow him to move on. Instead, he found himself locked in moments from his past. The pizzeria, his son's room, his underground bunker. It was as if his brain's neurons were all firing at once, overloaded, mixing and matching all his biggest fears, regrets, failures. What was this place? How did he get here? He called out into the silence. <laughs> Then they started coming. Without warning, animatronics, both new and old, began to jump out at him, bite him, rip him limb from limb. The pain was immeasurable. Make it stop. Make it stop. William, for the first time, longed for death, an end to this torture. Just as it felt like he couldn't take it anymore, everything was quiet again. It was as if the world had been reset. There was a brief moment of quiet, and then the onslaught began again. Dozens of faces from his past all focused on him. A waking nightmare that he couldn't escape from. More pain. More ripping. It was his own personal hell, but why? Why couldn't he just die? And then he saw them, a group of characters he never thought he'd see again. Those janky, stolen characters that had started everything. The mediocre melodies. It had all started to go wrong once they showed up. Once Henry had made them. But mixed in with their obnoxious southern drawls, William heard something else. It was barely a whisper, but he could just make out the words. He tried to release you. He tried to release us. But I'm not going to let that happen. I will hold you here. I will keep you here. No matter how many times they burn us. That voice. He knew that voice, but from where? Pover looks so dumb with this shit. Oh, you couldn't be more fucking correct. <laughs> the one he shouldn't have killed. William thought back. He'd done a lot of awful things, but there was always the one that stood out. Not Charlie, his drunken act of revenge. Not Susie, his first true murder, no. Instead, it was the one that he had lost control with. The one that he had broken beyond repair for no good reason other Cassidy. than because he could. The one Cassidy. that he stuffed inside the golden bear that his partner used to wear. Cassidy. They were back, and now they were trying to punish him. To make him suffer like he'd made them suffer. It was almost like William and Cassidy's souls had been locked together, fused by a collective rage and spite. Each refusing to move on. But while Cassidy was so focused on taking revenge, they actually did the one thing that would be the downfall for so many others. They kept William alive. Even though fire should have destroyed the remnant that was coursing through his being, Cassidy kept William breathing, paving the way for his escape. How? I swear to God, if, if you motherfuckers say remnant, I'm gonna be so fucking pissed. Some spirit bullshit. Okay. <laughs> His soul so powerful that he managed to put a part of himself inside the circuitry that housed the springlock suit. And there, his consciousness lay, inside a single circuit board, waiting. Waiting for someone to find him and set him free. A person that no one would suspect. Vanessa! Uh, do I care about this? Oh shit, this is kind of like...
important. Oh, fuck. Michael Afton is the character that we play as up until Ultimate Custom Night. Mike Schmidt and Fritz Smith, the security guards for FNAF 1 and FNAF 2 respectively, get fired for, quote, tampering with the animatronics and odor. So weird connection between the two of them, right? But now, look at the phantom animatronics that are haunting us in FNAF 3. They use models from both FNAF 1 and FNAF 2, meaning whoever is sitting in that security guard chair, Fazbear Frights, they have to have seen both locations and their animatronics. And that's not all. Their designs are burnt. It's a weird detail in the game, and it's something that the character encyclopedia repeatedly calls attention to. The burned texture for these phantom animatronics. Why is that so unusual though? Fazbear Frights is the first time in the franchise that we hear about anything burning down. From that point on in the story, it's like the characters turn pyro and are suddenly setting fires left and right. But for the first three games, nothing ever catches fire. The animatronics are just moved or repurposed in some way. So when did they burn? And why would our security guards see them as being burned? Someone has to have been going location to location, setting these places on fire, purging the sin of the past. We know we're definitely playing as Mike and sister location in FNAF 6 based on the in-game dialogue. And in FNAF 4, there's an easter egg where we can hear the phone call from night one of FNAF 1, meaning that whoever's in that bedroom has heard the recording as a security guard. But he's a fucking kid. He's a kid before... What? I... What? 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 Also know that Mike has seen the nightmare animatronics based on his drawings in the security logbook. So overall, there is solid evidence that connects all of FNAFs 1 through 6. You'll also notice how the character encyclopedia doesn't have a page for Mike Afton. This thing has a page for Chocolate Bunny Bonnie, but not Michael. Some tells me they don't want us to confirm how many games he's been in, because that would confirm too much of the theory. In short, this gives us an incredibly compelling and complete narrative. Mike as our protagonist, and William his father as our antagonist. Mike accidentally kills his brother in Fredbear's mouth, which begins our story and sets William down his pathway of destruction. Mike is then haunted by the guilt of his past and is looking to make things right across the rest of the games. In Sister Location, he learns what his father's been up to and realizes what he has to do to correct it. After failing to finish the job in FNAF 3, he ultimately helps Henry end it all in FNAF 6. It is great. It is a clean narrative. There is just one problem, timing. Mike's quest can't really start until he's been down to Sister Location, seen Baby, and gotten himself scooped. That's when he finds out about Afton's secret life. It's also when he's gonna start to smell because, you know, he's a walking, talking, rotting corpse. And we know that he's not going down into the bunker until the Funtime animatronics have been made, Freddy's has been closed, and Afton is out of the picture. That all should be happening post-1993, after William is sealed behind a wall. But that then presents us with a few problems. Afton has already dismantled the original animatronics as we see in the FNAF 3 minigames. How are those things getting burned if they're already deconstructed? But more importantly, we see FNAF 2 paychecks with the date 1987. That is way earlier than I think it can be. To be fair, Fritz Smith's pink slip on night 7 doesn't have a date, but it's a bit weird to say that the first few nights are in 1987, and then employee number 3 is hired on years after the I, 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 I don't know anything. I, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> why, why did I get so many fucking comments telling me to watch this shit? Why? This theory makes no fucking sense it doesn't make any sense the other one that i watched made so much sense i still didn't understand some things but i at least understood it i don't fucking get this where's l chip am i really watching this Am I really gonna watch this? Oh man. Oh man. One last video. So at this current point, oh wait, before we watch this, at this current point, Michael's dead. All the anim animatronics are dead. The only one who's alive is William Afton because Cassidy is keeping him alive. Not exactly. The people were gone too. William was dead. Henry was gone. A whole generation. No, no, no. William wasn't dead. No. <laughs> Matt Pat, you're fucking wrong. You said, and I call. Bruh were gone too. William was dead. Henry was gone. A whole generation- Wait, Henry killed himself in the fire? I didn't know that. Everyone the company had ever touched was dead and gone. Well, all except one. Pay your child support, you deadbeat. I'm keeping the diamond ring. I also set the house on fire. Clara Afton. She'd been there in the early- What? Back when things with William were good, they'd had the perfect home, a thriving business, the ideal family. But shortly after their youngest son died, things started to change. William had become distant, lost in his work, obsessive. She had watched him change from this irritatingly brilliant man that she had fallen in love with to a drunken monster struggling to hold himself together. And despite her trying to reach out to him in those desperate days, he was just too far gone.
True. How does she have hair here when she was bald on the chair? Theory makes no fucking sense. Admit it. You wanted to let me in. For her sake, she had to leave the relationship. And from there, she largely faded into obscurity. A mystery from William's past. A footnote in his history. And that was fine for her. She wanted to leave that part of her life behind. She tried to move forward, never wanting to hear the name Freddie Fazbear again. A time defined by mistakes and broken promises. But then, the paperwork started to arrive. As Fazbear Entertainment began to close as a corporate entity, suddenly her mail was flooded with notifications, requests, obligations. She had been there since the beginning, helping William in the early days of his business, and now, as a shareholder and sole living member of the Afton family, all copyrights and trademarks of both Afton Robotics and Fazbear Entertainment passed on to her. Memories of this past life that she had long left behind. Looking at the blueprints, the contracts, the memos, she felt old wounds begin to reopen. The regrets of a happy family that had been torn away from her. William had always been brilliant. That's what had attracted her to him in the first place. But he'd also been too blinded by obsession and pride. He was too jealous, too petty, too unable to actually see a bigger picture. But now, holding the paperwork that contained decades of heartbreak and trauma, she realized it was her turn. She was holding what? the power. This was her chance. And one thought resonated in her head. I will put them back together. I will- What? So she's a crazy bitch too? Oh my fucking god! She would be the one to rebuild this family. To rebuild the pieces of that shattered life. To reclaim the kids that fa- what, Where is this information coming from, by the way? What what video game? What video game book? Rada rada. Where is this coming from? Nowhere. His ass. Look, source, trust me, bro. Where is this coming from? To rebuild her family, she would first need to rebuild the franchise that had stolen them away from her. With ownership over the characters, their licenses, the technology patents and the Fazbear name, she converted the corporation back to an LLC, a structure for smaller businesses that are usually family owned. <sighs> The irony was fitting. From there, she would need remnant, and lots of it. Remnant was the key. So she murdered kids. Clearly, in the later years of his life, William had been using Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals as a remnant farm, sending robots to kids' birthday parties in the hopes of nabbing bits of the stuff here and there. But clearly, it wasn't enough. He had, what, like four, maybe five animatronics going out every week? No. It was a decent idea, but to get the remnant they required, it needed it's scale. Pog Dozens, as fuck. hundreds Holy shit. of animatronics all out there, all gathering remnant from unsuspecting customers. But to do that would require help, something William would never ask for. For. William had kept everything in-house. His obsession with control limited him. Clara, though, she wasn't nearly that precious. So she contacted a mid-sized delivery company, DLZ Shipping Solutions, to help build replicas of all the original animatronics. And with field delivery apps being all the rage, why not an animatronic delivery service? Order one to celebrate your birthday, your Halloween party. How about So we can show up at your house and kill you? A 4th of July picnic. We'll invite Liberty Chica and 4th of July Freddy on over. Boy, what the fuck are these? <laughs> Oh, what the fuck, dude? What the fuck? Why am I watching this? She would make sure that they made skins for every occasion. Chocolate Bonnies for Easter, Shamrock Freddy's for St. Patrick's Day, Dia de las Muertos, Chicas, and the- Hey! I'm fucking- I'm so over this shit. Service was it's born. Pog as fuck, right. holy the shit. fun time service, you'll never be alone again. You'll always have someone watching your back. Markiplier is canon. Holy fuck. Absolutely. Was it a sellout? No doubt. It was exactly the sort of thing that William would have hated. But it needed to be done to get enough remnant. Normally, the novelty of ordering an animatronic wore off after like, what, one, maybe two times? But with new skins for new holidays, suddenly you had yourself- Holy fuck. She literally had different skins. Oh my god, dude. Get the Freddy's Battle Pass. ...an animatronic perfect for every occasion. It would keep people hooked. It would keep them ordering the latest and greatest that Fazbear Entertainment LLC had to offer. And all the while- while they'd be collecting and returning the remnant back to her. In a word, it was brilliant. Was well, yeah, well, yeah, the way to get the remnant is they would murder kids. Okay. There's just one problem with it. No one trusted the Fazbear name. The company's brand was still mud in the public eye. No one would want to hire animatronics from the restaurant franchise known for murdering children. Nothing kills a party quite like the threat of death, you know. So she needed to find a way to discredit the stories that had come before. She needed to win back the public's affections, reactivate some nostalgia for the spooky stories of their childhoods. She needed a game. Multiple games. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking...
God. They lied to all of us. They told us that the whole point of this VR game was to undo the bad PR done by a rogue indie game developer. But that's not true at all. Those indie games were designed to conceal and make light of what happened. This isn't just an attempt to rebrand. It's an elaborate cover-up. Struggling game developers were a dime a dozen online, most working on their magnum opus between shifts at the Dollar General. So she found one. Steve just picked him out of obscurity. Boy, what up, Steve? The right mix of desperate and doofus willing to say and do anything for a couple extra bucks. And he fell right in line. It's pog as as fuck, holy shit. Little Not gonna lie, I understand like none Mangle's of this. Quest, Balloon Boy's Air Adventure, Five Wait. Nights at Freddy's. So she, so, wait, 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 wait. So she made video games to make it look like the rumors of the animatronics murdering kids was fake so what video games did she make how does that make any fucking sense how does that cover up the fucking story of the, how how does that cover up that that if anything that makes it more true no that makes no fucking sense bad gameplay with even worse graphics but hey they got the job done people were suddenly talking about the clues inside of these things Sir So, motherfuckers trying to figure out the FNAF lore is canon in the FNAF lore. Do so you mean to tell me that there's a motherfucker like me in FNAF losing their fucking mind at this dog shit writing? Okay. Searching for the hidden lore. They were actively making jokes about dead kids at pizzerias. Her husband's twisted history of serial murder had suddenly been reduced to a mere Nancy Drew mystery to be solved. The plan had worked. Freddy Fazbear's was suddenly more popular than ever. Things were going shockingly well. Her takeover and reboot of the franchise was full and complete. Suddenly infused with cash, she built the largest, most ambitious project yet. The mega- It's Pog as fuck, okay. holy This shit. is the most it's recent- game okay. William had always been so visionary but always thought so small scale he was careful to a fault not her though she knew that this latest project needed to be big it needed to be flashy it needed to be a palace for children a place that got people talking and checking out the latest in Fazbear products so with a steady supply of remnant flowing in it was finally time the stage was set it was time to get to her real goal literally rebuilding a family why would she want to rebuild the family after she left them? I do. March 2035. The first was obvious. The crying child. Her little boy. The one that was the first to get ripped away from her. She'd seen down in his bunker that William had gotten very close to replicating artificial humans using animatronic technology. And so that's exactly what she would do. Rebuild her boy. True. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. The 1930s was when William uh, found the idea of the fucking... A bear and now it's 2035 how old is the wife how is she alive this bitch is 110 trying to murder kids make this make sense to me she's 110 years old and she's trying to revive a family so what she could die in two months from fucking old age i oh, holy fuck this is so stupid from the ground up using robotic parts his shaggy brown hair, his favorite striped shirt, even down to small details that no one would notice, like the band-aid on his left knee. William's research had even found ways of making animatronics that could bleed and process food, making them virtually indistinguishable from a typical human. He would never have any idea of what he actually was unless he was explicitly told. The only things that could possibly ruin the illusion were any overrides to his internal systems. If something were to say, interfere with the cameras that he had in his eyes, or cause some sort of a core reboot to his hard drive, or x-ray his metallic bones then yeah he would be exposed but otherwise to the outside world he was just your typical normal human wait this kid in the game is an animatronic gregory is a fucking animatronic she worked down in the bowels of the pizzaplex giving him life but it was one thing to build him it was another to help him remember his identity he died so young so early in their history that there was no preserved memories for him. No documentation that she could just download into his digital brain. So bit by bit, she trained him, forcing him to remember who he was. In a corner of the room, she even made a makeshift dinner table, a reminder Boy. of happier days. The family recreated two brothers, a sister, a father, and the mother at the head of the table. The one in charge, the one in command, the one bringing all of this to fruition. But his progress was admittedly slower than she would have liked. At first, he could only communicate through 
simple ones and zeros, then rudimentary drawings and crude letters. But bit by bit, images of his past life started to come through. Balloons, colors, houses, bears and faces, birthday parties, all for me. Gregory was alive. As the robot boy embraced her, she felt a warmth that she hadn't in decades. This, this was the joy that she'd been working towards. This was what it was all for. Her son, back in her arms again. The plan was working. He had to keep going. Next was William. If the family was truly going to be put together, she would need him. And she it's knew exactly where he was. In the shit. ruins of that old Freddy Fazbear's pizza place hot. where Henry had trapped him. In fact, that's specifically why she insisted on building the pizza plex there over the sinkhole. It was the best place to hide what her true intentions were with the entire operation. Digging through the wreckage, she found him. He was right where she thought he'd be. Seeing the putrid shell of the Springtrap suit, though, was not something she was prepared for. The rotting corpse of William Afton was disgusting. Scorched flesh fused into the fur lining. Hollow black sockets where eyes once were. A smell that reeked of- How is it not dissolved? What? How- how? How is it? How do? You, how do? You, how, how does motherfuckers? How? It was clear that her work was cut out for her on this one. Afton was practically lifeless. The man may not have been able to die, but he was about as close as you could come. And his body would need a lot of reconstruction, replacement arms, and endoskeleton reinforcements. Wait! 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 wait. So hold on. For oh. Gregor, uh, hold, shut the fuck up. I had surgery today. Oh. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Post-surgery pain is better than this shit. Sorry, I, I'm glad your surgery went well. She made Gregory, but she made Gregory from scratch. But for William, she had to find his old body. Why? 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 That doesn't make any sense. Why? Remnant is not from children's, not adult. It's from children, not adults. And how is he even going to come back alive? What? She went down to see if she could salvage him. But why? His mind is in the computer. I know about that fucking theory where his mind is in a VR game, but they haven't explained that in this shit yet. Let's let's keep watching. In the meantime, though, she threw the husk that was once her husband into a life support pod infused with aerosolized remnant to help keep him stable. But more important than recovering his body was recovering his mind. In his current state, he was comatose, an empty shell. Severe brain damage starts at temperatures over 108 degrees Fahrenheit. 42 degrees Celsius, and years of repeated fires had burned his brain to goo. But wait, I thought he never technically died. Wait, 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 right. He never technically died because Cassidy was keeping him alive to torture him. On was the brilliant, frustrating mind that had drawn her to him in the first place. But she had a plan. Unlike her darling boy Gregory, Afton had found ways to record his consciousness. Fundamentally, the brain is only a series of electrical connections after all, so why couldn't you replicate that in the form of a standard circuit board? In essence, you could create a digital consciousness. And one thing she knew about William, he was nothing if not cautious. A planner. Someone who had backup plans to his backup plans. And sure enough, there it was. Buried in piles of old animatronic CPUs, a record of Afton himself. But she needed someone to test it. Someone was definitely here during the night. It had to have been the client. I mean, they sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation, told us to scan it, said it would expedite the process so we wouldn't need to program any pathfinding ourselves. Unlike the other games that she'd paid to have made in the past, this one had a different purpose. This wasn't about PR, it was about getting William back up and running, spreading his virus to the masses. You acknowledge. But oh, why? She literally left them. Why? Why? Why does she have this motivation? It's so. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Knowledge that Fazbear Entertainment is not responsible for accidental digital consciousness transference, real-world manifestations of digital characters. She hired a new developer, Silver Parasol Games, to scan the boards and bring her husband into the system. And because of the immersive nature of VR, William's consciousness would be able to merge with the player, giving him a new body, a new agency. There was just one complication. Afton's hold wasn't as powerful as she had hoped. He wasn't able to gain complete control. The first trial run, Jeremy, was so desperate to escape from his grasp that he sliced his own face off with a paper shredder. Messy. Afton's followers were reluctant, to say the least. But it was the second attempt that looked like it had the potential to kill two birds with one stone. Enter Vanessa. Wait! 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 Uh, what? No, that... No, 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 no. William Afton became a white woman. So fuck this lore. Okay, let's talk about the current lore. Okay, the movie has Vanessa 
in the movie. But the movie also has Springtrap Bonnie in the movie. Make that make sense. How are both of them there? So William Afton's now a woman. Congratulations. She started as a QA tester at Silver Parasol Games, the VR game development company that was part of her plan to bring back William. But more importantly, Vanessa checked all the correct boxes. Right age, blonde, green eyes with a fondness for flowers and the outdoors. In many ways, it was her daughter all over again. Ex Wait, what? Wait, what? I thought this was William. Wait, what? No. What do you mean? No. What do you mean? No. Uh... <sighs> Except it wasn't just looks and personality. What really mattered was Vanessa's mind. She was fucking crazy. Underconfident, coming from a broken home, motherless, able to be manipulated. Yes. She would do nicely. She would be the one to save dear old daddy, just as the real Elizabeth would have wanted. I will make you proud, daddy. While testing the VR game, William's digital consciousness merged with Vanessa. Oh, sure, she <laughs> fought, fragmenting Afton's code into a series of tapes hidden across the game, trying to do web searches to regain control over her life, but it wasn't enough. She was weaker than Jeremy. She was a thrall that, despite occasional moments of lucidity, had to obey. And with Vanessa, it was a two-for-one deal. She was getting a daughter back while also bringing her husband one step closer to reactivation. She just had to make sure that Vanessa was headed the right way. The reborn Gregory was an expert hacker, part of the benefits of being an Afton and a robot. So Clara had him keeping tabs on Vanessa, hacking into her emails and trailing her therapy sessions to ensure the future Elizabeth was falling in line. I would much rather the movies be canon than this horse shit because this doesn't make any fucking sense. It would make more sense if fucking children were murdered and they possessed robots and that was it you know that was it and they lost their minds they went crazy they haunted the place rattle 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 right that would make more fucking sense than this shit therapists started to ask too many questions they were promptly dismissed from their positions. And while Gregory kept tabs on Vanessa's personal life, Mrs. Afton made sure to clear a path for her professionally. With Silver Parasol's collapse at the hands of the anomaly, she then had the possessed Vanessa bring the contaminated circuit boards to DLZ shipping and the Fazbear Funtime service. More glitches, more remnant, more Afton. But it was her last move that was the best. In a true masterpiece of poetry, she brought Vanessa over to be chief security officer at the Pizzaplex. A true family tradition to don the hat and badge and all it took was a recommendation from the top as well as some emails marked for deletion. Sure, Vanessa didn't have relevant experience for the job, but when it comes directly from the CEO, does it really matter? Husband, son, daughter. A corpse, a robot, a human. Guilty. Wait, I thought the whole point of this remnant shit was to try and get her children back. I thought she was trying to get the spirits of her kids back, but that's not what she's trying to do. She's just trying to make some bullshit up and pretend they're her kids. Bring her family back in general. Okay. 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 She's trying to bring her family back in general. Gregory is just a robot that learned. There's no fucking crying child in Gregory. Vanessa is not the little girl. She's just Vanessa, somewhat controlled by William, but not really controlled. She still has her own free will, kinda. So... What's the fucking point of murdering other random children? If you need remnant, what are you using the remnant for? Using it on Afton. She's using every single fucking remnant ever out of all these children she's murdering on Afton. So Vanessa is just a random woman and Gregory is a robot. Got it. All that was left was Michael. Poor, troubled Michael. The boy that killed her youngest. The one that would spend years trying to make his guilty conscience right again. A self-professed protector. While she knew she needed him to complete the family, something told her that the problem had already solved itself. Something had shifted when using Glamrock Freddy to excavate the buried pizza place. I have been here before. I found myself for the first time when I cleared the path. I have changed. My friends are here, but I can protect you. I am not me. Maybe it was the remnant that had coursed through Michael's veins. Maybe it was the spirit of Michael living on as a protector. So Michael is the fucking bear. If remnant is only coming from children, how the fuck is Michael, now a grown-ass man, being the bear? I hate this. I hate, it doesn't make sense. Michael was a child. Yeah, that's crazy. He was a child. And guess what? Children fucking grow up. And when he burned, 
And when he died in the fucking fire, which was in 2023, he was clearly an adult and died. So how the fuck is he the goddamn bear? Because he died as a child. Oh my God. No, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. You're wrong. You're wrong. Yeah, he got scooped, but he didn't die. He was kept alive and he grew he still fucking grew does it matter if you don't grow lengthwise you still age you have a fucking birthday so how the fuck is he the fucking bear hover they're gaslighting you you're making a good point thank you this is officially my seventh fucking five nights at freddy's video that i've watched i've listened to every fucking theory i've i've, I've learned everything and this shit makes no fucking sense i hate it i don't even want to finish this but I will. But he was there, somewhere inside of Glamrock Freddy. She could feel it. And just like that, she'd won. She'd done it. Sure, there were still some kinks to work out, some final brainwashing of Vanessa, some rehabilitation of William, but they were there. Remember, this old fucking hag is doing all of this at 110 years old. Knighted. A happy ending. And that's how it could have ended. That's how it should have ended. Had it not been for a- That's how it should have ended? Fuck off! Few unanticipated developments. For one, something was just wrong with the pizza plex. Almost as if the entire building was haunted, possessed. Puppet plushies hiding on ceilings, behind crates, places that they had no earthly way of belonging. Staff bots with greasy tears down their eyes acting like they were being puppeteered by some sort of a nightmare. Even their sounds had the echo of nightmares long past. <laughs> It was as though a guardian spirit of the past refused to move on. As long as her husband was around, it too would linger. Only now, it wasn't just in one body, but it was in the essence of the building it's itself. Pog, she had fuck, seen stories of houses shit. built on Hi. burial grounds getting possessed by angry spirits, but she'd never assumed... So Charlie's back somehow. Okay. ...assumed that it could be real. Then again, in a world of living spirit metal and mind-controlling glitches, who was she to be so judgmental? The whole thing was ridiculous. Why would this be the line that she refused to cross? After all, the Pizzaplex was built over the burial ground of angry spirits but it of course it was it was the power cords that finally convinced her that something was wrong suddenly these cords were striped black and white like the security puppet from generations ago the very foundations of this place the materials and wires that constituted it were rebelling against her against the aftons against the quest to bring them all to map had did all this fucking research had all this animation made and the story fucking sucks and it was being helped by something else something slithering through the building maybe they were connected she couldn't be sure but a blob of living wires could be heard oozing through the walls stealing pieces and parts of the old animatronics showcased in rockstar row she could only assume that it was a byproduct of all the remnant they'd been collecting from afton's testing she knew that both light and dark remnant existed one of positive emotions and the other created from anguish anger agony now there's two different remnants okay Perhaps this, this thing, was an amalgamation of all the darkest parts of the pizzeria's history. A collection of the hatred still housed inside these defunct endoskeletons and exosuits. As long as it was left alone, it seemed to be harmless. But if any Afton outside of Michael got too it's close, Pog it was fuck, holy shit. Even young Gregory, looking to punish the family that had been complicit in its horrible creation. Little did she know, though, that Gregory should have been her biggest concern. That bringing the family together would have some unforeseen consequences. Gregory was normally the goodest of boys. She had had literally built him that way but lately he'd been disappearing more and more often disobeying her orders <laughs> requests she knew that he loved playing on the arcade machines once the pizza plex closed being so good as to top the leaderboard on practically all of them but lately he was nowhere to be found she suspected his absence had to do with glamrock freddy's failed performance the other night when he malfunctioned live on stage almost as though the core programming of freddy responded to seeing this rebuilt small boy almost like it awakened something inside of him she'd have to make sure that vanessa was on the lookout for him but she'd soon come to learn that vanessa wasn't enough whether it was the influence of the nightmare puppet or a reawakened hatred of animatronics seated deep in gregory's code something had caused him to rebel to rip apart each animatronic in the pizza plex bit by bit this boy was tearing down the empire that she'd so painstakingly built freeing vanessa from her mind control destroying the remains of afton in the basement setting glamrock freddy loose as her carefully created world crumbled around her one more time she began to plot her revenge she would have to bring them all to ruin
That shit is so fucking ass. I don't know why you guys made me watch that. The other video was better. Every single person who commented, watch MatPat, I hate you. You were wrong. That shit fucking sucked. That shit was terrible. Like the video. Hey, 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 hey.